It was the end of the summer of 2011. I was about to turn 19, and I was spending time with my best friend, who was a few years younger than I lived in a rural area in southwest Virginia, about 15 minutes from Harry's Mouth in North Carolina, around here, practically everything. Closes until 10 p.m., so we needed to find ways to pass the time on our own. But that was never a problem for us, as we always managed to find ways to have fun at night. It started harmlessly first. We went to the mall, and afterwards went, roamed the streets looking for girls things that any teenager would do when that didn't work out. We decided to go bowling until closing, then we went to the main street a little before midnight just to walk down some of the alleys pretending to be the bold boys they thought it was, but we never. Felt like we were in danger as the area doesn't have a lot of violent crime after exploring all the streets we got bored, and decided to eat something at the Waffle House, as it was pretty much the only. Late night meal option at the time after to eat and make a quick stop at Walmart, we weren't ready to go home yet, so we started driving on the roads of Campo. This was nothing new for us, since as I said around here we had. To create our own fun and driving late at night was always the our choice, the road we were on now. I had driven maybe once before during the day, even though it wasn't far from where we lived. We just had no reason to go on it when we were still in North Carolina at first the road was paved, but after. About after a kilometer, it entered back into Virginia and turned into a dirt road like many of the dirt roads around here. The town didn't pay much attention to this road since it was so far away and had very few houses and the road was often unpassable in heavy rain. We had to drive very slowly being unfamiliar with it. We were going slowly, although we were more cautious the road looked the same as any road we used to take at this time. The roads are basically empty around here at this time and with only a few houses along this road we had sure that we wouldn't. In counter traffic, the road is predominantly surrounded by forest and passes at the foot of a small mountain at night. It's easy to miss the few houses along it. We would probably have passed them all. Without noticing if we hadn't noticed a light on in the corner from our eyes, we both looked and noticed a man standing under the porch light. We didn't see details of the man, but we could see that he was watching us standing completely still, except for the head that followed us with his gaze. Although we were both tense, we tried not to think too much at that. We thought it was just someone going out to smoke a cigarette. It's just his manner that made us so uncomfortable, although nothing happened. With that man watching us, this was just the beginning we gradually increased the speed because we were getting a little more restless. The more we talked about that in just a few minutes, we reached the end of the road and were back on the paved road which I was much more familiar with and driving about once a week it turned right and we felt a lot better as we could speed up and leave it for back thoughts. About that man, we enjoyed the views of this road that runs along the top of a small mountain offering beautiful views of the city below. After a few kilometers, we reached the end of this road and turned again to return to my house. This road is a little more wooded then than the one we had just left, but I was even more familiar with it as I had driven or driven it thousands of. Times before, as we headed back towards the main highway, we saw something ahead in the far reaches of the lighthouses. The servos are common around here, so we thought that it was just one of them, and as we slowed down, we began to notice that it was much wider than the brown fur of a being, however. Both of us were used to seeing the occasional albino, so we still assumed that it was just that. As we got closer, we noticed that they were not an animal, but definitely a human being hunched over with their back to us walking in the left lane traffic as it should be, I looked at my friend when he asked what the hell that person was doing walking at this time of night. I looked back at the person and finally managed to see the silhouette of an older woman with disheveled gray hair wearing a white t-shirt and pants. She still had her back to us until we were about 15 meters away from her. When she finally turned around, we got the first view of her face. I don't want to say she was under effect of canine or other drugs, but it was the impression that she had deep eye sockets with dark circles under her eyes and oily hair as well as very aged skin. I'm not sure how old she was, but if I had to guess, I'd say she was in her 40s or 50s. But that wasn't the case. Worse, she raised her hands in the air and started waving frantically and running towards us when she did this. We could see what if to be dried blood on her t-shirt and pants, plus something that resembled a large knife in one of her hands. We had no we were sure of what she wanted, but the desire to be the daring kids disappeared instantly. We sped up and didn't slow down until we reached the highway. We were so scared by what had happened that what would normally be a quick five minute drive to my house turned into a detour of 35 minutes just for the absurd thought that she could follow us there in small communities like this. You pretty much know everyone yet. None of us had ever seen this woman before. 
Nor did we see her again. We kept an eye on the local news for any story about a bloodied woman being found. But we never heard anything I can't even begin to formulate an explanation for why. She was walking down the roads at almost four in the morning in those conditions with blood on her clothes and a knife in her hand considering all the risks of a human or animal confrontation that she would face fast forward to the present day. I now live with my wife on that quiet road in the mountains between the two roads of the incidents and I use the latter road almost daily. But I have yet to see a sign of that strange woman since then, only at the beginning this year. There was a big police operation related to drugs and cockfighting near the house of the man who was watching us. I don't know if it was the same house or if these people even lived in the area at that time. But after everything that happened, I often found myself, I asked if this was the same house. Maybe that man was guarding the place and the woman. I just hope I never cross her path again. I was driving from Sao Paulo to Campos do Jordo towards my friend Joe O's cabin for a weekend volleyball week. At the time of this story, I had two cars, a 2013 BMW 3 Series and a 2006 Ford F150 that I was driving that particular night mine. Volleyball equipment was in the bed of the truck. I was about 45 minutes from the cabin, my friend, when it was late around 10 p.m. It was completely dark on the roads and it was snowing there were practically no other cars on the road except me at that time I had just got my truck back from the mechanic a few weeks ago as I often face problems with it unfortunately that night things were no different precisely at the worst moment on a quiet and dark road the engine suddenly started to overheat arriving in the family zone of the marker I reduced the speed and stopped on the side of the road waiting for the engine to cool down then I resumed the journey slowly but even at a reduced speed the indicator needle rose again to red indicating that the engine was overheating. Once again, I had to stop again and turn off the truck, open the hood to try to identify the problem. But in the dark and intense cold, I was unable to diagnose the problem. Question, I needed to call Joe O, but there was no cell phone signal on that road, so I couldn't ask for help. At that moment, I felt in trouble. I got into the truck again to start it and at least wait inside it in the heat while the engine was running. It seemed like it wouldn't overeat while stopped it. Tried driving once again, but the same problem occurred again. I had to wait about 10 minutes until I saw a car passing by. I added the emergency lights. I opened the door and waved to get attention there. Car passing by stopped. It was a Toyota little. The driver rolled down the window and I thanked him for stopping asking to use his phone. He agreed and asked what had happened. I explained that my truck was overheating and that I couldn't drive anymore. Then he asked me if I was alone. I stopped for a moment and I said yes. He took his cell phone and handed it to me. It must have been a local resident. As he had a cell phone signal, I called my friend Joe O, he answered, and I asked what I should do. He told me to call a service company. Specific tow truck nearby and that he would come pick me up. I gave him my exact location and he said it was on the way after that. I called the towing company he recommended to me and asked for assistance. During both calls, the man in the car watched the entire time I tried not to look back. However, after the calls, I gave the phone back to the man and thanked him. He said nothing and without saying anything else, watched his taillights disappear completely as he went down the road. Yet again, I was alone. I went back to my truck running to stay warm. I turned off the headlights for just a moment to give you an idea of how dark it was. Outside, when I say I couldn't see an inch beyond the windows, I'm not exaggerating. It was absolute darkness. I sat in the truck waiting and waiting. I couldn't do anything that required an internet Connection, I ended up playing on my cell phone for 20 minutes until I heard a bang on my passenger side window. Due to fright and through the window, I couldn't see the person outside very well. It was very dark outside and the headlights didn't really illuminate the sides of the truck, I heard them. Voice of a man begging for help. He was screaming for me to open the door, saying it was freezing. I heard him trying to open the door alone, but it was locked. I directed the light of my flashlight to them window but it barely helped me see who was outside all i saw was someone wearing a very large black coat with the hood over my head i screamed asking what was wrong and the mysterious man outside responded saying he was lost and trapped needing to get out of the cold i didn't trust it i sat there nervously trying to figure out what to ask to him to prove that he wasn't someone trying to do me harm I couldn't even think of anything to say before he started aggressively trying to open the locked door and then started living in the glass with even more force. Screaming desperately for help, in the heat of the moment, I decided to follow my instinct. I put the truck in gear and he noticed this by starting to knock harder on the window in an attempt to break it in, 
drove the truck onto the road and accelerated to 48 chem slash H, despite the damage I was certainly causing to the engine overheated. But then I saw something I didn't expect, and my heart seemed to stop for a moment. As I went over a hill on the road, I noticed the reflection of taillights. Approaching on the side of the road as I passed the parked car, I realized it was the same Toyota from before the man was driving. I slowed down. I rolled down the window to see if the man was in the car, but I didn't see anything. It looked like the car was empty. I looked out the window for a moment and saw footprints in the mud. That means the man who was driving knocking on my window. It was him and he was trying to trick me into opening the door without knowing what he would do. I continued driving the truck aware that I was causing damage to the engine. But at that point, I didn't care. I stopped a few minutes later when I saw headlights approaching on the other side of the road. I got excited. When I realized it was the tow truck, I signaled with the lights and he stopped alongside the driver, got out. And I told him what had happened. He joked that he arrived at the right time and asked if the man had a gun or something like that. I replied that I couldn't see, he replied. So we better do this quickly. It took him about 15 minutes to connect the truck to the trailer. And during that time, the Toyota never overtook us. It was possible that he turned around and went in the direction opposite. For this specific reason from the tow truck driver to call Joe O again. And we agreed to meet at the mechanical workshop to summarize the rest of the story. Joe O and I still went to practice volleyball that weekend and at the mechanic workshop, they replaced the damaged water pump of my truck that was causing overheating. I sold that truck a few weeks later. I'm relieved that I didn't roll down the window or unlock the doors for that man trying to get into my car in that situation. I could have been the victim of a violent crime and no one would have ever known who did it one time I was driving down these narrow dirt roads in the middle of nowhere in Russia and it was pouring rain in the middle of the night. The rain and the roads were so bad that I was slowing down to 20. It came an hour sometimes and I couldn't see any of the signs this was before GPS so I had to pull over to the side of the road to try to see the sign and figure out if I was going in the right direction. I couldn't get out of the car because of the rain. So I was craning my neck forward, trying to identify where I was, when suddenly the passenger door opened, and a stranger started trying to get into my car in Russia. There is a considerable amount of violent crime and vehicle theft, so I instinctively started to panic, screaming and shouting as loud as I could, accelerating the car and escaping before the guy had a chance to actually get in. As soon as I got the first opportunity, I quickly leaned over and closed the passenger door and continued down the road. I was breathing so heavily, my heart was beating so hard in my chest at that moment, and I was trying to calm myself down as much as I could, almost crying. I kept seeing that scene in my head for the rest of the trip. It was definitely the scariest thing that ever happened to me here in Russia, and I'd do the possible to not drive at night anymore. Next time, maybe I won't be so lucky I used to study at the University of Braslia, so whenever I could, I would hit the road back to Sioux Paulo to visit my family in Friends, it was a solid five-hour trip, but sometimes I missed home so much that I drove on Friday and was back late on Sunday. The fact is that I used to spend a lot of time driving at night. So one week, my mother called me with very bad news. My grandfather was seriously ill and had to be rushed to hospital for treatment. She wanted to know if I could visit him with the implication that it might be my last chance to see him. The call came at around 11.30 p.m. M. So I quickly packed my bags told my roommate where I was going and for how long, and began the overnight trip back to Sao Paulo. A few hours later, I was driving through a dry, rural area of Minas Gerais, when I decided to do one of my usual stops on that route to clarify it was just an hour before the Sao Paulo border, and I was very familiar with that specific stop because I used to do the same little ritual whenever I got. Ready to enter Sao Paulo, as I used to drive alone a lot in Brasilia, I, I used to carry a concealed weapon at the time I had an extended license that allowed me to carry worship in several states except Claro Sao Paulo. I parked my car and began to disassemble and store my weapon to comply with Sao Paulo's gun laws when I finished leaving to go to the bathroom and get a coffee before continuing on my journey. What I didn't know was that someone had managed to get close to my car and was hiding. Along the passenger side when I passed them, Whoever it was grabbed me from behind and I let out the loudest, blood-curdling scream I could, not to alert anyone nearby, but mainly because I realized that there was basically no one around to see what was happening. I did everything I could. I fought and tried to get away from the guy, but I wasn't doing well. Very well. I tried to kick him, 
but he counterattacked by lifting me off the ground where I couldn't reach him, and then I tried to free myself from the grip he had on me, but that only made him bend me over on himself still behind me. I'm not sure how long I screamed and fought, but when I heard the tires screeching, my fear multiplied a thousand times, I thought the guy had a partner, and that I was about to be thrown into the trunk of a car or something and I never more would be seen in reality. It was a car full of local teenagers. God only knows why they were at that gas station so late, but I thank God they were there because I think they literally saved my life that night. The teenagers jumped out of the car and ran into them. Our direction and the guy who grabbed me ran away. Two of the boys chased him through the woods beyond the gas station on foot, and the driver and the other boy made sure I was okay. They waited with me until the police arrived so I could tell them what even happened. They brought me a cup of coffee and gave me a cigarette even though I don't smoke, I felt like I needed one to calm myself down for years afterwards. I used to send thank you messages to each of these guys on the anniversary of my near incident. What if, if I hadn't lost the cell phone where their numbers were saved? I would still do that because no matter how much these boys decided to be heroes that night, there are so many people in the world who would have closed their eyes and pretended they didn't see anything. And I thank God I hadn't been one of those people who happened to decide to stop in the parking lot when I needed them most North Carolina. She grew up with her parents and two older brothers, Arver and Guy, who later described her as a sociable, laid-back young woman with a love of football and live music, however. As she progressed into adolescence, her family was hit by a series of sudden and unexpected tragedies when she was just 17 years old. Leah's father was diagnosed with a long-term respiratory illness, and three years later, her mother passed away suddenly due to an undiagnosed heart condition. After taking a brief period off from school to deal with the situation, Leah was almost killed in a serious traffic accident in the fall of 1998. She suffered a punctured lung and a broken femur, which led doctors to insert a metal rod in your leg to aid in the healing process. Months later, in the spring of 1999, Leah temporarily dropped out of school again to spend more time with her dying father, who passed away a few weeks later in early April. In a way, the series of tragedies had positive effects on Leah, who became intensely interested in philosophy, spirituality, and artistic expression as a way of dealing with it all. However, it is no surprise that there were also many negative effects Leah had difficulty keeping up with her school. Work and dropped out of college in the early 2000s, just a few months before graduating with a degree in Spanish and anthropology shortly afterwards. Leah sought a fresh start in the nearby town of Hallie and on her 13th birthday, she was living in a small apartment with her best friend Nicole. She often spent time in local coffee shops and was said to be cultivating a passion for writing, but without a doubt, Leah's true passion was traveling after two separate backpacking trips through Europe and Central America. She developed a serious case of wanderlust, indulging it through regular car trips with friends. It's not hard to see that the thrill of discovery was very therapeutic paralysis. Because she was escaping the old, in search of the new March 9, 2000 began like any other day to read, and Nicole and they made plans to take care of the children together the next day. It seemed like Red, no, I was distressed or worried about something, and evidently felt comfortable making plans for the near future, but then for some reason at around 6 p.m. that night Red packed a suitcase, withdrew $3,000 from an ATM when on a car trip that appeared to be 3,000 Chem United States. Nicole stayed surprised at Leah's rudeness, although it wasn't unusual for her roommate to go on long car rides to leave, so suddenly it was definitely out. Of character, after three days of not being able to get in touch with Leah, Nicole got in touch with Leah's sister Guy to ask if she knew where she was worried. Guy joined Nicole in searching Leah's room for clues as to where she might have gone. It was then that they found an envelope containing cash and a handwritten note, the note dated March 9, and it said, Dear Nicole, this is to cover her bills. While I'm gone, remember everyone is together in thoughts and prayers. And time passes quickly. Have faith in yourself. Help boss with. Easter at Laura's house. Have fun with the kids. Give me the laptop to Peter. Sends everyone my love see you. Soon tell the guy not to worry. Even if she finds cookies in the freezer with love, read below the main. Text. There were some scribbled addenda, some of the which said, I won't take my own life. I'm the opposite remember Jack Kerlock on the road, a reference one of Leah's favorite authors, Jack Kerlock, who wrote a book called On the Road, detailing his car travels across the United States. The reference still convinced, plus those close to her there, that she simply went on an impromptu car trip. 
An opinion shared by a friend named Janine Killer Janine met him on a visit to her favorite coffee shop, and the two grew closer over their love of Jack's writing. Remembering from the last conversation they had, Junin Ho remembered Leah acting strangely, but mentioned that Leah had expressed a desire to visit Desolation Peace in rural White County, Washington, a place mentioned in Jack's autobiography Dharma Bombs, an impulse to search for revealing that she had power of attorney over her sister, a precaution she had taken while Leah was spending time in Costa Rica. It meant she could access Leah's bank records and use ATM transactions to plot her route. It appeared that Leah was following and heading west and after leaving Halley in North Carolina, she passed through California before heading north towards the same time in Washington. It seemed that Leah really had the desolation. Pick in mind, as she had mentioned it, Adianine Killer, the cohesive thinking demonstrated by Leah encouraged those who were worried about her. However, they still found Leah's sudden departure deeply worrying and were desperate to see her return to safety. Nine days after Leah's disappearance during the afternoon of March 19, a man named Lionel Packett and his girlfriend were running through Mouth Baker as Nokiomi National Park in Washington County, Washington. At one point in the run, Lionel noticed a piece of clothing hanging from a tree and a plan. Investigation, he discovered an abandoned vehicle under an embankment on the side of the road, the Deep Cherokee of 1993. It was badly damaged and surrounded by a disorganized collection of clothes and other personal belongings, several covered were placed on the windows as if someone had camped inside the car, but it was abandoned at the time there I did not find. Based on the amount of damage authorities believed the DIP was moving at about 30 to 40 MP when collided with the embankment and overturned several times, anyone inside would have been seriously injured or killed. However, there was no evidence that anyone was inside the vehicle at the time of the accident. There were no traces of hair or blood. The seatbelt was not tensioned and there were signs that someone had hit their head on the steering wheel or windshield details that gave hope to those hoping for Leah's safe return after the discovery of Leah's DIP-2 full search and rescue teams searched the surrounding area using sniffer dogs and a helicopter but found no trace of the missing person. A search of the deep revealed 2500 hidden in a pair of Leah's jeans along with several empty food containers. Pull, however, the search found two items that Ella's loved ones found. Very worrying the first was an ornamental wooden box containing a ticket to a screening of the film American Beauty. The fact that a simple item was in a decorative box indicates that the ticket had significant sentimental value to read however it was unclear why she brought it with her on her car. Trip across the country, the second item. Of concern found in Leah's deep was her mother's wedding ring. Nicole described the ring as being sacred to Leah and again, it was unclear why she chose to bring it with her. However, its presence in the deep was something that investigators found it deeply disconcerting given that Leah's vehicle was so close to the road, it was highly unlikely that she had wandered off into the woods and investigators suspected that she had gotten a ride in search of help. This theory was confirmed by the fact that there were several reports of sightings of Leah throughout Washington state in the days following her disappearance. A man claimed to have seen a young woman resembling Leah at a Texaco gas station in Everest about a mile south of where his DIP was abandoned, the man stated that Leah appeared disoriented and had no idea who she was or where she lived. However, before he could offer assistance, she got into a taxi and disappeared. Other witnesses reported seeing Leah in a coffee shop and at a train station in Bel M, north of where her DIP was found, these sightings raised hopes that Leah was still alive and seeking help. However, despite all the reinforcements from the search teams and ongoing investigations, the whereabouts of Lear, Roberts remains unknown. This theory was confirmed by the fact, although there were several reports of lie sightings throughout Washington State in the days following her disappearance, a man claimed to have seen a young, Lee-like woman at a Texaco gas station in Everest, about 70 miles south of where his deep IP was abandoned. The man stated that Leah seemed disoriented and had no idea who she was or where she lived. However, before he could offer assistance, she got into a taxi and disappeared other witnesses reported seeing Leah in a cafe and at a train station in Bel M, north of where her DIP was found. These sightings raised hopes that she was still alive and seeking help. However, despite all the efforts of search teams and ongoing investigations, Robert's whereabouts remain unknown to this day. She remains missing, leaving her family and friends with distressing questions about what happened to her during that fateful car ride.
Robert's case remains an unsolved mystery and a sad story of disappearance.